Hey guys, hope you are all well today. It's been a little while since I made a video and honestly, there isn't much to talk about AMC or GameStop in particular. There has been, however, a lot of things changing in the overall economy that is worth discussing over. I actually delayed making this video because, as foolish as it sounds now, I was hopeful. I was under the impression that Congress would get its act together before the weekend started and avoid a government shutdown. I did not want to put out a video only for Congress to then get its act together and then find myself rushing to pump a new video updating things. But being that the Congress of the United States of America deliberately loves to screw its constituents more more than your typical Brazzers gangbang, let's talk about the issue at hand. I have seen way too many people confuse and mix a government shutdown with the debt ceiling, when they are very distinct. I want to talk about what a shutdown is, what it means for you and what it means for the stock market based on historical data. A government shutdown happens when Congress simply put, doesn't approve funding for the federal government by the time the new fiscal year starts on October 1st. It results in a full or partial government shutdown until Congress gets their act together, but do note that government functions that are deemed essential will continue. Because many federal workers are off the job during a government shutdown, many services are stopped or slowed down, disturbing the day-to-day -day life for many Americans. As far as what this could mean for the economy, the margin of events that could transgress is pretty vast, so it's hard to give a general idea. A government shutdown can have serious consequences with the growth of an economy. Given the high inflation we are experiencing, I would bet it would add further uncertainty in the markets as well. Investors have been getting more bullish these past couple months, but a shutdown could make people weary that things are more delicate than they might have seen weeks ago. The most important factor in a government shutdown is the length of it. Depending on how much Congress drags this stagnation on, we could see the economy get hit in the unemployment rate, the lowering of growth in the gross domestic product and rise in the cost of borrowing. If you are looking for a figure, some analysts have said that the government shutdown could cost the US economy around $6 billion per week, and it could shave off 0.1 percentage points in the fourth quarter of 2023. The job for Jerome Powell will certainly be made worse by such event. Let's talk about the markets a little bit more. A government shutdown may temporarily affect bond prices, but the impact varies. The Move Index, which gauges bond market volatility, increased during some past shutdowns but decreased during others. Despite this uncertainty, Morgan Stanley's Global Investment Office suggests that US Treasuries remain attractive, especially for investors concerned about shutdown risks. Historical data shows that, on average, 10-year Treasury yields tend to decrease slightly while prices rise during shutdowns, indicating investor preference for safe haven assets. Importantly, the government continues to make coupon payments to bondholders during shutdowns, reducing payment risk. As a result of this, don't be surprised to see stocks beginning to go up. I know this sounds a bit contrarian, but hear me out before nailing me to the cross. Historically speaking, Stocks have gone up during five of the past shutdowns, dating back to 1995. The S&P 500 is slightly up on average during all 22 shutdowns. A shutdown, as I explained earlier, means that many federal offices will be closed and a large chunk of federal workers won't get paid, but essential services will not be affected. Washington will prioritize sending out Social Security and Medicare payments, and the post office will remain open as too. So as you can see, a shutdown isn't going to really affect the economy too much unless it begins to drag on. If Congress continues to act like children on a playground for weeks on end, this little rally is going to be the opening act to a horror story. As I said earlier, it will be costing billions of dollars per month to the government and it will not only affect growth to the economy, but make the Fed's already impossible task of reducing inflation back down to 2% even harder than it is. We are already in a vulnerable position economically speaking, I will even say vastly different to that when the other shutdowns have occurred, so it makes this scenario a bit more challenging to forecast, but in my opinion, the real barometer of how bad things will get has to do with timing. If it's just a couple of days, I think the stock market will remain relatively flat, which will present a good opportunity for investors to actually start grabbing high-quality stocks for a nice little discount. But if things continue dragging on, expect Wall Street to start getting grim about it all. Let's now move on to everyone's favorite story arc, Evergrande, the troubled developer that has been making headlines for years now, has not been able to recover at all. In fact, their challenges deepened as it issued warnings about its offshore debt restructuring plan, which faced complications due to a regulatory investigation into its main subsidiary in mainland China. 
This followed news of Chinese authorities launching their first criminal probe into Evergrande since its default on debt nearly two years ago. Although Evergrande briefly reported a narrower loss for the first half of the year, thanks to increased revenue from a brief upturn in China's property market, subsequent developments have been overwhelmingly negative. An increasing number of investors are contemplating the company's liquidation if it fails to devise a viable survival plan soon, leading to heightened concerns among investors. The implications of Evergrande's struggles extend beyond the company itself, as its 2021 default triggered a crisis in the property sector, which continues to adversely affect the broader Chinese economy. We have talked about this in great detail over the course of dozens of videos. The fall of this developer could unleash a domino effect across more developers and in turn, sink Chinese economy into a deeper hole than it already is. Evergrande has been attempting a government-supervised debt restructuring, with debts totaling $328 billion as of June. It proposed a multi-billion dollar plan to reconcile with international creditors and filed for bankruptcy protection in the United States as part of the process. Should the restructuring efforts falter and Evergrande fail to reach new agreements with its creditors, liquidation could be the outcome, involving the sale of assets and a halt to all operations. Recent weaker sales prompted Evergrande to cancel meetings with creditors this week. Investors are anxiously monitoring the situation, with concerns about whether Beijing's measures to stimulate housing demand are effective and their potential impact on overall economic growth. According to Frederick Newman, chief Asia economist for HSBC, if the property sector does not rebound strongly, which appears unlikely at present, economic growth is likely to be substantially lower than in recent years due to its significant size. The situation recently got worse, as Forbes magazine reported that the billionaire chair and founder of Evergrande Group is now being investigated over suspected illegal crimes. We know that shares of the company were halted amid mounting concern over its future. Evergrande said its chairman Wei Ka Yan has been placed under mandatory measures in accordance with the law, that the company had recently been notified that authorities declined to elaborate on the nature of the measures Wei is subject to. Evergrande now has lost almost all of its value from its peak. The drop as of making this video has it as 42% this week. Hui's own net worth now stands at $3.2 billion. For comparison, his net worth was around $42.5 billion a couple years ago when Evergrande was at its peak in 2017. I will continue updating this story as it develops. GameStop said on Thursday that billionaire investor Ryan Cohen will be taking over as the CEO of the company, while also retaining his position as chairman, and said that he would not be collecting a salary. GameStop's board voted unanimously to appoint him as the retailer's top executive. This move comes a little over three months after GameStop decided to fire CEO Matthew Furlong, though no reason was ever shared with investors. We also know that a couple weeks later after he was fired, the CFO Diana Sada Jaje resigned. I am glad to see that GameStop finally now has a CEO, hopefully now we can actually start seeing the company engage with investors as they have been far too quiet for my liking. I'm working on a couple videos for you guys this next week. I wanted to release this one today a couple days ago but like I said, I was under the impression Congress would have come together by now. Thank you for watching this video, I hope to see you on the next one, to the moon.